بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. We begin today's program with the Qiraat, the recitation from the Holy Quran by Brother Ashraf Muhammadi. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد أفلح المؤمنون الذين هم في صلاتهم خاشعون والذين هم عن اللغب معرضون والذين هم للزكاة فاعلون والذين هم لفروجهم حافظون إلا على أزواجهم إلا على أزواجهم أو ما ملكت أيمانهم فإن هم غير ملومين فمن ابتغى وراء ذلك فأولئك هم العادون والذين هم لأمانتهم وعهدهم راعون والذين هم على صلاتهم يحافظون أولئك هم الوارثون الذين يرثون الفردوس هم فيها خالدون صدق الله العزيم The translation from Surah Al-Mu'minun, chapter 23, verses 1 to 11. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. The believers must eventually win through those who humble themselves in their prayers, who avoid vain talk. who are active in deeds of charity, who abstain from sex except with those joined to them in the marriage bond, or the captives whom their right hands possess, for in their case they are free from blame. But those whose desires exceed those limits are transgressors. Those who faithfully observe their trusts and covenants, and who strictly guard their prayers, this will be the heirs, who will inherit paradise, they will dwell therein forever. Verily, Allah has spoken the truth. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum, may peace be on you. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, welcome all of you to today's program. The Islamic Research Foundation strives for Islamic Dawah, the proper presentation, clarification and understanding of the message of Islam as well as removing misconceptions about Islam amongst less aware Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Reason, logic and modern scientific understanding are the basis of all its presentations. The IRF office complex has a video cassette library, a publications department, a cable and satellite television production studio, an audio video recording department, and a computer department. It also has a multi-purpose audio visual reading room, an auditorium, a sales outlet called Islamic Dimensions, a ladies wing, and a children's wing. These provide the much needed facilities and services for understanding the overall excellence of Islam and its teachings. The IRF office and its facilities are open from 10 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. daily except Fridays. The regular programs of the Islamic Research Foundation include 
organizing public lectures, followed by open question and answer sessions, symposia, open forum interactions, and such programs, providing more than 3,500 video cassette titles on Islam and comparative religion to the public on free hire for seven days, free distribution of more than 50 publications on Islam on request, distributing the Holy Quran with translation for understanding the message of Allah meant for the whole of humankind, regular interaction internationally on the internet for presenting the message of Islam. The IRF has its own website. Through cable TV network relays in Mumbai alone, the IRF video cassettes on Islam reach more than one million homes for almost three hours daily. The ATN satellite television channel telecasts IRF programs on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays from 6 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. Indian Standard Time across 68 countries of the world. The NEPC satellite TV channel and other TV channels too telecast IRF programs regularly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our striving in his way and grant us more opportunities and will to serve his deen dedicatedly. Ameen. Dr. Zakir Naik is the president of the Islamic Research Foundation. Dr. Zakir has left his medical profession to devote himself wholeheartedly in spreading the truth of Islam as well as removing misconceptions about Islam amongst non-Muslims as well as less aware Muslims, especially through his public talks and TV programs the world over. He is appreciated more so for his convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences and critics at his public talks. Salah is the most important pillar of Islam, after Iman or faith. Salah is the Arabic term for the Muslim prayer which is commonly known as Namaz in Urdu. Today, Dr. Zakir will present the Islamic perspective and concept of Salah and its objectives in his talk on Salah, the programming towards righteousness. Brothers and sisters, Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi, wa sahabi ajmain. Amma baad, auz billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim, utlu ma uhiya ilayka min al-kitabi, wa akim al-salata, inna salata, tanha an al-fashai wa al-munkar, bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim, rabbi shuhali sadri, wa yisilli amri, وَحْلُلْ أُقْدَةَ مِنْ لِسَانِي يَفْكَوْ كَوْلِي My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, blessings and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. The topic of this morning's talk is Salah. The programming towards righteousness. Most of the people, they translate Salah into English as the prayer. The prayer is not the exact translation of the Arabic word Salah. Because to pray means to beseech, to ask earnestly. Like how you pray or beseech in a court of law. To pray means to supplicate, to ask for help. The dua is the supplication, the prayer. Salah is not merely to pray. It means much more than that. Because in Salah, besides asking for help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we Muslims, we also praise Him. We also receive guidance from Him. And the Salah simultaneously is a sort of programming. It is a conditioning, or in layman's terminology, it is brainwashing. 
But if someone is going to offer salah, and if a person asks him, that where are you going? And if he says he is going for brainwashing, or if he is going for programming, it will sound odd. Therefore, I personally do not mind if people use the word prayer or the Arabic word salah. But they should remember that salah is much more than merely to pray. The moment you hear the word programming, you start thinking of a computer. If you allow me to call the human being a machine, I would say it's the most complicated machine on the face of the earth. It is much more complicated than the most advanced computer in the world. And we human beings, we are the Ashraful Makhluqat, the best of creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Holy Quran says in Atin, chapter number 95. Verse number four. Lakat khalaknal insana fi ahasani taqween. That verily we have created the human beings in the best of molds. The psychologists, they tell us that our mind is not directly under our control. The body is directly under our control. If I want to lift my hand, I can lift it. If I want to bring it down, I can bring it down. If I want to take a step forward, I can take it. The body is directly under our control. But the mind is not directly under our control. Therefore, most of us, we might have experienced that while we offer salah, our mind keeps on wandering. And suppose, if a student, after appearing for his examination, if he offers Salah, he starts reviewing his examination paper in the Salah. He starts thinking that the answer I gave to question 2, instead of this, I should have written that. If a businessman offers Salah, he starts thinking that how much profit have I made today? How much goods did I sell? If a housewife, if she offers Salah, she may start thinking that what should I cook for my husband? Should I cook biryani or should I cook pulao? It's very common that during Salah, our mind keeps on wandering. Why does the mind wander? The reason is because our mind is empty. And a mind cannot remain empty. Therefore, it wanders. Most of the Muslims, they know the basic things that we recite in our salah. The Surah Fatiha and the few verses of the Holy Quran or the short surahs of the Holy Quran which we recite in the salah. We Muslims, we recite it so mechanically that even if you wake up a Muslim from the middle of his sleep and ask him to recite Surah Fatiha, he can do it 100 miles per hour. It's mechanical. And because it is mechanical, only a minute portion of a mind is utilized in reciting the mechanical portion, which we know by heart. That is Surah Fatiha and the other verses of the Holy Quran. Most of us Muslims, since we are non-Arabs, we don't understand Arabic as a language. And because we don't understand what we are reciting in our salah, there are high possibilities of our mind wandering. Therefore, to prevent our mind from wandering, we should recite the Arabic portion and simultaneously recall the meaning of the things you are reciting in the salah. If you know English, Recall the English translation. If you know Urdu, recall the Urdu translation. If you know Hindi, recall it in Hindi. If you know Marathi, recall it in Marathi. If you know Gujarati, recall it in Gujarati. Recall the meaning of the things you are reciting in the language you understand best. For example, 
when we recite Surah Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Most merciful, most gracious. Malik Yawm al-Din. The master of the day of judgment. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. Thee alone we worship, thee alone we ask for help. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Show us the straight path. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Sirat al-lazina an amta alayhim, ghair al-maghdubi alayhim, walad ballin. The path of those who have earned high in favor. And of those whose path is not wrought, nor who go astray. When we recite the Surah Fatiha, all the other verses in Arabic, simultaneously recall the meaning and your mind will not wander. Because, again your mind is occupied in recalling the meaning of the Arabic portion that you are reciting in your Salah. But, after a few weeks, a few months, even this becomes mechanical. Your mind is very powerful. You recite the Arabic portion and recall the meaning because the mind is very powerful and again there are chances your mind will divert. But there are less chances because a little portion of your mind is occupied in reciting the Arabic portion and another portion of your mind is occupied in recalling the meaning. There are less chances it will divert but yet it may wander. To prevent your mind from wandering, besides reciting the Arabic portion, and recalling the meaning, you should even concentrate on what you are reciting and recalling. A human being cannot concentrate 100% on two different things. He can concentrate 50% on two different things, or 80%, 20%. But 100% on two different things, he can't concentrate. So the more you concentrate, the less your mind will wander. So to prevent your mind from wandering, you should recite the Arabic portion, recall its meaning and concentrate on the meaning. Then inshallah, your mind will not wander. I start my talk by quoting a verse from the Holy Quran, from Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 45, which says, Utlu ma uhiya ilayka min al-kitabi wa ki salata inna salata tanha an al wal munkar which means, recite of what we have sent by inspiration of the book to thee. And establish regular prayers. For verily, prayers restrain you from shameful and unjust deed. The Holy Quran says that Salah restrains you from shameful and unjust deed. As I mentioned earlier, Salah is a sort of programming. It's a programming towards righteousness. And we Muslims, we are programmed five times a day in our salah. And we ask for guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ihdina surat al-mustaqeem. Show us the straight path. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the answers. He programs us towards righteousness. For example, the imam. After Surah Fatiha, he may recite Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, which says, Ya ayyuhal lazina amun, O you who believe, innam al khamru al maithiru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal ansab wal azlam, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishum min amali shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork, fashtanibullah lakum tuflihun, Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Here we are being programmed in the Salah that you should abstain from intoxicants, from gambling, from idol worship, from fortune telling, because these are Satan's handiwork. The Imam, he may recite after Surah Fatiha, Surah Maida, chapter number 5. Verse number three, which says, Hurrimat alaykumul maitudu waddamu walahmul khinzir. 
وما هو الا لي غير الله به فوبن فيو فور فودا ديد ميت بلاد ذا فلاش اوف سوين ان اني فود اون ويتش اني نيم بيسايدز الله هاز بين ووكت يو وي ار بين بروجرامد ان ذا صلاه ذات ذا فود ذات يو شود نيفر هاف ذا فوبن فودز ار ديد ميت بلاد ذا فلاش اوف سوين and any food on which any name besides allah has been invoked on it we are being programmed towards righteousness the imam after surah fatiha he made said surah al isra chapter 17 verse number 23 24 which says that allah subhanahu wa taala has ordained for you that you worship none but him and that you be kind to your parents and if any one of them or both of them reach old age do not say a word of contempt don't even say off to them but address them with humility and lower your wing of kindness to them and pray to the lord that have mercy on them as they cherished me in childhood we are being programmed that we have to be good to your parents and if any one of them or both of them reach old age yet you should not even say off to them we have been programmed in our salah the computer normally requires programming only once but since the human mind has a free will of its own which the computer doesn't have the human beings have to be programmed regularly because the amount of wrong things we see around us in the society like is teasing bribing cheating robbing alcoholism drug addiction molestation there are high chances that our mind can get deprogrammed therefore we have to be kept on being regularly programmed to keep us on the sirat al mustaqim on the straight path some people may ask that why don't you offer salah only once why offer five times a day for a healthy body a human being requires minimum three meals a day if he has one meal a day he will not have a very healthy body similarly for a spiritual soul a human being requires minimum five times of programming five times of salah one is not sufficient that's the reason we muslims we offer salah five times a day the jews they offer prayers three times a day which is also mentioned in the old testament in the book of daniel chapter number 6 verse number 10 we muslims we offer minimum five times salah every day and it's a commandment of allah subhanahu wa taala which has been given to all the muslims and it's mentioned in the holy quran in surah bud chapter number 11 verse number 114 in surah isra chapter 17 verse number 78 in surah taha chapter number 20 verse number 130 and surah rum chapter number 30 verse number 17 and 18 these few words of the holy quran they instruct the muslims to offer salah five times a day the five daily salahs which we muslims should offer are the fajr salah which begins from any time between the break of dawn till just before sunrise the second is the zuhar salah after the sun reaches its highest point from the decline of the sun till the midpoint between noon and sunset third is the asar salah after the zuhar salah ends until just before sunset the fourth is the maghrib salah immediately after sunset till the end of twilight and the isha salah immediately after twilight it can be offered till the beginning of dawn but it is preferable to be offered before 12 in the midnight 
a Muslim should offer salah minimum five times a day. And then we offer salah. And before we enter the mosque, we Muslims, we remove our footwear. And this was the same commandment which was given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Musa alayhi salam, Moses peace be upon him, which is mentioned in the Holy Quran in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 11 and 12. When he approached the fire, he heard a voice, O Moses, verily I am thy Lord. Put off thy shoes, for thou art in the sacred valley of Tua. This was a commandment given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Musa alayhi salam. A similar message is mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, chapter number 3, verse number 5. It says, He, Lord Almighty, says to Moses, Draw not nigh hither, take off thy shoes from thy feet, for thou art on sacred grounds. A similar message is repeated in the book of Acts, chapter number 7, verse number 33. The Lord tells to Moses, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for thou art on sacred grounds. And we Muslims, we are even given the option to wear the shoes when we enter the mosque or when we offer salah by our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our beloved Prophet said, but when you wear the shoes, the soul should be clean. And it's mentioned in Abu Dawood, volume number one, in the book of Salah, Kitab salah chapter number 240, hadith number 652, the Prophet said, Be different than the Jews, for they always, during prayer, remove their shoes or sandals. It's also mentioned in Abu Dawood, volume number one, in the Kitab salah chapter number 240, hadith number 653, that Amr bin Shweb, on the authority of his father, said that his grandfather said, I saw the Prophet pray both barefooted and with sandals. The reason we Muslims, we take off our shoes, before we enter the mosque or for salah or clean the soles of our shoes is because we are hygienic people. We want to keep our place of worship clean. Before we offer salah, there is a call for prayers. And in different religions, you have different ways of calling people to come to prayer. For example, the Jews, they use the trumpet, as it's mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, chapter number 10, verses 1 to 3, Lord spake to Moses and told him to make two trumpets of silver and to use it to call the assembly. The Christians, they use the church bell. Some tribes, they use the drum. In Islam, we use the human voice. And the call for prayer is called as Adhan. And the person who gives the Adhan is called a Mu'addin. The human voice is much more melodious and soothing as compared to the trumpet, bell or drum. And there is a much better impact on the human being. There are many non-Muslims who have reverted to Islam only by hearing the Adhan. They were so impressed with the melodious Adhan, which had a tremendous effect on their heart, mind and soul, that they accepted Islam. But unfortunately, all the Adhan that we have in Bombay they aren't as melodious as they should be. And they cause more inconvenience to the human beings than tranquility. Therefore, I request all the Mu'addin, 
that they should hear the adhan of the Harmain Sharif, Masjid Nabi in Medina and Masjid Haram in Makkah, as an example of what adhan should be like. Besides the adhan being melodious and soothing, it also carries a message. But unfortunately, most of the non-Muslims, they do not know what the message of the Adhan is. Last December, I had been to Kerala to attend a conference organized by the Muslims, in which they also invited a non-Muslim minister, who was giving a talk on the stage. And he was speaking a few good words about the Muslims and about Islam. And he said that we Indians, we are very proud of the Muslims. We are proud of the Mughal rulers, the amount of monumental buildings they made, the beautiful structures they made. No wonder you Muslims, you praise Emperor Akbar five times a day. It may sound like a joke, but it's very common that many non-Muslims think, especially of India, that we praise Emperor Akbar in the Adhan and in our Salah. There are some non-Muslims who are impressed by the Western movies, which very often show the actor dressed up in an Arab garb, who's a villain, who's a terrorist. And before he draws out his sword, he says, Allahu Akbar. So non-Muslims think, that Allah Akbar is a war cry which the Muslims give before killing the non-Muslims. It is the duty of every Muslim to clarify these misconceptions from the minds of the non-Muslims. And we should give the message of Adhan. Tell them the translation of the Adhan. That's when we give the adhan and when we recite, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It doesn't mean that we are praising Emperor Akbar or it's a war cry, but it means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest. Almighty God is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I bear witness that there is no deity but Allah. Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hayya li salah. Hayya li salah. Come for salah. Come for salah. Or come to prayer. Come to prayer. Hayal al falah, Hayal al falah. Come to success, come to success. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. We have to explain the meaning of the Adhan to the non Muslims. It is the duty of the Muslims that we deliver the message of Islam and explain about it to the non-Muslims. And before we offer Salah, we always have to do ablution. That is, we have to wash ourselves. That is, we have to do wudu. This is mentioned in the Holy Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 6. That, Ya ayyuhal lazina amunu. O oh, you who believe, when you prepare yourself for salah, wash your face and your hands and arms up to the elbow. Rub your head with water and wash your feet up to the ankle. It's compulsory that every Muslim should do ablution, should do wudu before we offer our salah. And a similar message is given in the Holy Bible, in the book of Exodus, chapter number 40, verse number 31 and 32, that Moses, 
and Aaron and the sons washed their hands and feet thereat. And they entered the temple of the congregation. And when they approached the altar, they washed as was commanded by the Lord to Moses. A similar message is given in Acts chapter number 21, verse number 26. And Paul took the men away. And the next day, along with them, he purified himself and entered the temple. We Muslims, we do ablution. We wash ourselves. We do the wudu. Before we offer the salah, to keep ourselves clean. We are hygienic people. And besides keeping ourselves clean, the wudu is also a sort of psychological preparation, a mental preparation that we do before we communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 56, hadith number 429, that the earth is made as a place for me and my followers to do sujood, as a masjid. Masjid means a place to do sujood. Our Prophet said that the whole world, the complete earth is a masjid for the believers. But natural, the place where you offer your salah, where you do sujood, it should be clean. It's also mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adan, chapter 75, hadith number 692, and ask me Allah be pleased with him. He said, that the companions, when they stood for salah, his shoulder touched with the shoulder of his companion, and his foot touched with the foot of his companion. A similar message repeated in the book of Salah in Abu Dawood in chapter number 245, hadith number 666. The beloved Prophet, before starting the Salah, he said, Straighten your rows, stand shoulder to shoulder, close in the gaps, and do not leave any opening for the devil. The Prophet was not referring to the devil which you see in the Onida TV ad on the comic strip with two horns and a tail. The Prophet was referring to the devil of racism, of caste, of color, of wealth, irrespective whether black or white, whether rich or poor, whether king or pauper, to whichever family you may belong. When you stand for Salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. The basic method, the outline of offering Salah is given in a nutshell in the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 144, that turn your face to the sacred mosque, wherever you are, turn your face in that direction. It's compulsory that when we offer Salah, we should face the Qibla, that's towards the sacred mosque, towards Kaaba. And in India, we Muslims, we have to face towards the West. And when I travel in India, if I don't know the Qibla, the direction, and if I have to ask a non-Muslim, I do not ask him where is the West. What I do is I ask him where is the East. And then I face in the opposite direction. Otherwise he may think that we are worshipping the Western world. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 238, that when you stand for remembering Allah, stand in a devout frame of mind. The Holy Quran says, stand in a devout frame frame of mind when you offer Salah. And reciting Surah Fatiha is compulsory in the Salah. And it's also mentioned in Surah Al-Hijr, chapter 15, verse number 87, that we have sent to you 
the oft repeated seven verses and the grand quran the oft repeated seven verses refers to surah fatiha and it's also called as the minor quran and the other portion of the quran is called as the grand quran it's compulsory that we should recite surah fatiha in every salah the word ruku that is bowing is mentioned in the holy quran no less than 13 times and the word sujood which is the best part of the salah is mentioned in the holy quran no less than 92 times and it's mentioned in 32 different surah of the holy quran and there is a separate chapter chapter number 32 called as as-sajda the prostration and the holy quran says in surah al imran chapter 3 verse number 43 Ya Maryam muknuti li rabbi ki wasjudi warqai ma raqeen O Mary worship thy lord devoutly prostrate thyself and bow down with those who bow down The Holy Quran says in Surah Hajj chapter 22 verse 77 Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu O you who believe prostrate and bow down and humble yourself and do good deeds that you may prosper Every prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he offered his prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he did sujood he did prostration all the prophets and a similar message is also given in the bible if you read in the old testament in the book of genesis chapter number 17 verse number 3 says abraham fell on his face book of numbers chapter number 20 verse number 6 moses and aaron fell on their face book of joshua chapter number 5 verse number 14 joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship it's mentioned in the holy bible in the gospel of matthew chapter number 26 verse number 39 that when jesus peace be upon him goes to the garden of gethsemane he takes a few steps forward falls on his face and does prayer all the prophets of almighty god did it the sujood for offering salah and even an acrobat cannot do better than what we muslims do when the bible says fall on your face and pray to god the way we muslims do the reason we do sujood is as i mentioned earlier the mind is not directly under our control the body is directly under our control and in order to humble the mind you also have to humble the body and there is no better way of humbling the body than to put the highest part of the body the forehead which also has the frontal lobe of the brain which is the most important organ to the lowest part on the ground and then say glory be to allah the most high glory be to allah the most high regarding the minute details of how to offer salah where to keep the hand how to stand how to sit etc how many rakats to offer the holy quran says atiullah wa atir rasul obey allah and obey the messenger you have to look at the prophet the quran says atiullah wa atir rasul in several places in surah al imran chapter number 3 verse number 32 in surah al imran chapter number 3 verse number 132 in surah nisa chapter 4 verse 59 In Surah Maida chapter 5 verse 92, in Surah Anfal chapter number 8 verse number 1, in Surah Anfal chapter number 8 verse number 20, in Surah Anfal chapter number 8 verse number 46, in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse 54, in Surah Nur chapter 24 verse 56, in Surah Muhammad chapter 47 verse number 33, in Surah Mujadila chapter 58 verse number 13, in several places, in Surah Taghabun chapter number 64 verse number 12, the Holy Quran says, "Atiullah wa atiy Rasul." Obey Allah and obey the messenger. For the minute details, look at the Prophet, and it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adan, chapter number eighteen, hadith number six hundred and four, as well as in Sahih Bukhari, volume number nine, hadith number three fifty two. The Prophet said, "Pray as you have seen me praying. Pray as you have seen me praying." So, minute details, you have to refer to the authentic hadith. The salah is the most important pillar of Islam after iman after faith 
and the Holy Quran says in Surah Dhariyad, chapter 51, verse 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَى إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have created the jinn and the men not but to worship me. And the Arabic word ibadah comes from the root word abd, which means a slave, a servant. It's the duty of every servant to be obedient to his master. And every human being is a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. And it's the duty of every human being to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment you follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are doing ibadah, you are doing worship. If you abstain from the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited you from doing, you are doing ibadah. Many people have the misconception that salah is the only form of ibadah. In fact, salah is the most important form of ibadah, but it's not the only form of ibadah. Following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ibadah, and salah is the most important form of ibadah. Salah can also mean rendering obedience. You can only be obedient if you know what you are reciting in your salah, if you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you to do. Therefore, it's compulsory that every Muslim should know what he is reciting in a salah. He should also read the Holy Quran. If he doesn't understand Arabic, he should also read its translation, its meaning, so that he can implement on the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are various dangers if a person doesn't offer salah. There are chances your faith can become weak or it can even get lost. Because the human being thinks that the well-being and honor that he has is due to the worldly material things. And he goes away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is lack of discipline. When he goes away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to acquire the worldly desires, the material things, there are chances that he may do foul play and go away from the Sirat al-Mustaqeem, from the straight path. There is lack of inner peace. Irrespective of how much wealth a person has, the wealth cannot gain him peace. And the reason that the people don't offer salah is due to lack of knowledge. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 185, Kullu nafsin al-mawd. Every soul shall have a taste of death. And you shall have your total recompense on the day of judgment. And only he who is saved from the hellfire and is admitted to the gardens shall have achieved the objectives of the life. For verily, the life in this world is a mere deception of goods and chattels. There are various benefits of offering Salah. Salah is a way of life. It caters to the spiritual aspect of your soul and the physical needs of your body. The Salah, it increases your faith. It strengthens your faith. The Holy Quran says in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 2, that the true believers are those who when Allah is mentioned feel a tremor in the heart. And when His signs are rehearsed, it strengthens their faith and they put their complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Quran says in Surah Fatiha, chapter 1, verses 5 to 7, Iyya qana abdu wa qana stain. Dear Lord, we worship, dear Lord, we ask for help. Ihdina surat al-mustaqeen. Surat al-lazina namta alayhim, gayr al-maghdubi alayhim, wala ballin. Show us the straight path. The path of those who have earned high favor. And of those whose path is not robbed. No who go astray. 
it increases the discipline of your life. A true Muslim, he starts his day by offering the Fajr Salah. And in the Fajr Salah, the Muazzin, in the Adhan, he also adds, as salatu khairu minan norm That Salah is better than sleep. Offering prayer is better than sleeping. And a true Muslim, at intervals, he offers Salah. And he ends his day with the Isha Salah before he goes to sleep. The Salah, it also improves the social conditions. The congregation Salah, it increases the brotherhood, the fraternity, the unity, and is an example of equality. The solidarity increases when the people of the community, they meet each other, and the love and affection between them increases. The Holy Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, Verse number 13. Ya ayyuhan nasu, inna khalaqnaku min zakru wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum. Shu'ubaw wa qaba ila ala ta'arafu. Inna akramaku min the law hiyat kaukum. Inna Allah alimun khabir. O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female. And have divided you into nations and tribes. So that you shall recognize each other. Not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa, who has righteousness. And Allah is all-knowing, full of wisdom. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not caste, it's not color, it's not creed, it's not wealth, it's not sex, but it is taqwa, it's righteousness, it's God consciousness, it's piety. The Holy Quran says in Surah Humza, Chapter 104, verse number one. Lumaza. Go to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. The Salah prevents us from scandal monging and backbiting. The Holy Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 11 and 12. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanum. O you who believe, let not men amongst you laugh at others. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. Let not women laugh at others. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. Do not defame. Do not be sarcastic. Don't call each other with nicknames. Ya lazina amanu, O you believe, avoid suspicion. For suspicion in many cases is a sin. Do not spy on one another. Neither speak ill about people behind the back. That means don't backbite. Are you ready to eat the flesh of your dead brother? The Holy Quran says that if you backbite, it is as though you are eating the flesh of your dead brother. Because eating the flesh of your dead brother is double crime. Eating flesh of a human being is a sin. Even the cannibals who eat human beings, they don't eat the meat of their own brother. So the Holy Quran says if you backbite, you are doing double sin. It is as though you are eating the flesh of your dead brother. Speaking ill about someone without proof is a sin. Speaking ill about someone behind the back is double sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and gives the answer. Nay, you will abhor it. The salah, it increases truthfulness and honesty in the business and the daily dealings. As I said earlier, the Quran says in Surah An Kabut, chapter 29, verse number 45, Utlu ma uhiya ilayka min al kitabi wa akim salata, inna salata tanha anil fasha iwal munkar. That recite of what we have revealed to thee of the inspiration of the book and establish regular prayers. For verily, prayers restrain you from shameful and unjust deeds. The Holy Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 81, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْ وَذَاكَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ Say, truly, truth has arrived. And falsehood perished. For verily, falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. Salah teaches us that we should be truthful. A similar message is repeated in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, 
verse number 42 and 43. That cover not the truth with falsehood. No, conceal the truth when you know it. The Quran teaches us to be truthful. To always be truthful. The Holy Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 188, that eat up not your wealth on vanities, so that you may use it as a bait for the judges to eat up little bit of somebody else's property knowingly or unknowingly. The Holy Quran says that bribing is forbidden. You should not bribe. It gives us a way how to lead a truthful life. The Holy Quran it brings a person inner peace. As it says in Surah Rod, chapter 13, verse number 28, that verily, in the remembrance of Allah, hearts do find peace and tranquility. Means when you remember Allah, when you offer salah, you have a peaceful life. You acquire tranquility. It is the best way of communicating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 153, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sta'inu, bisabri wa salah. O you who believe, seek Allah's help with patient perseverance and prayers. Inna Allah ma sabreen. For verily, Allah is with those who patiently persevere. Allah says, Inna Allah ma sabreen. For verily, Allah is with those who patiently persevere. Besides the social benefits, the spiritual benefits, and the other benefits, in Salah, we also acquire physical and medical benefits. In Salah, when we do Ruku, that is bow down, extra blood flows into the upper part of the body. The spine becomes supple. The spinal nerves are nourished. It relieves backache and pain. It's a good posture for flatulence. When we come back to the Ar-Rahku position, that is after Ruku, when we stand up, the blood which has entered in the upper part of the body comes back to normalcy and the body is relaxed. When you do Sujood, we put our forehead on the ground. It's the best position of Salah. It's the most important part of Salah. Daily, the human beings are propounded by electrostatic charges from the atmosphere, which gets precipitated in the central nervous system, which gets supersaturated. These extra electrostatic charges have to be dissipated and discharge. Otherwise, you will have headache, neckache, muscle spasms, etc. No wonder people regularly take tranquilizers and drugs to relieve the pain. These extra electrostatic charges have to be dissipated and discharged. For example, how do you have a heavy electric appliance? It normally has a three-pin plug. The third pin and the third wire is for grounding, for earthing. Similarly, when we do sujood, we put the forehead on the ground. And the best part of the body, the brain, and the best part of the brain, the frontal lobe, is put on the ground, which causes grounding or discharging of these extra electrostatic charges. That does not mean that if you put your hand below the musalla, the prayer mat, you get a shock. But there is dominance on the frontal lobe. And the thinking capacity of the brain is not on the top of the brain, it is in the frontal lobe. Therefore, we do sujood in salah. When we do sajda, there is extra blood supply going to the brain, which is responsible for a healthy brain.